Welcome to this webinar, Classification Standards and ISO 19650 in UK Construction, which has been held in association with Trimble Viewpoint. I am Thomas Lane, the Technical Editor of Building Magazine. The management of building information is essential to maximise the benefits of BIM, which in turn is the key to efficient building delivery and operation. Information needs to be consistent and well organized for all aspects of building design, construction and operation. Until recently, the organization of this information was laid out in BS 1192 and PAS 1192.2. Part ISO 19650 is an international standard which supersedes these British standards. Today, we will explore the importance of information classification in construction, what is happening now and what might happen in the future. So to discuss this topic, I'm joined by three experts um, who would like to introduce themselves. So um, over to you guys. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Stephen Howell. I'm Innovation Director at NBS, and I spend my days working on NBS Chorus, NBS Source, and also the Uniclass 2015 project. Hey, good morning. Thanks. My name is Adrian Chilliday, and I'm a Technical Director for Galliford Tri. And I look after design management and BIM, information management and the use of our viewpoint CDE. And I also look after our field view digital quality tools, along with looking at a uh, Grenfell outcomes and requirements and health and safety and some of our business management systems. Thanks, Adrian. Hello, I'm Ben Wallbank. I'm the BIM Strategy and Partnerships Manager at Trimble Viewpoint. Uh, I sit on the um, uh, UK BIM Alliance Technologies Group, uh, where I represent the data receiving end of the Trimble softwares um, and uh, lecture at various of the uh, BIM MSCs around the country. And oh, and I'm an architect. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Practical experience. Well, thanks, everybody. So um, the format of today's present um, session will be that we will be three presentations from each of our speakers. And then once those presentations are over, there should be some time for you to ask your questions and we can, um, you, can you can submit those via the um, web platform and then we'll put those to um, our panel. So um, Stephen is going to present first and will provide an update on the Uniclass classification structure, which is an ISO 196050 requirement for BIM projects. He will cover the role of classification, what is happening now, and what will happen next, and also the standardization of international classification. Adrian will present next um, with a contractor's perspective on the topic and cover how Galliford Tri uses classification, or doesn't as the case may be, and his thoughts on the future of classi classification. And then finally, Ben will cover the importance of classification with the UK annex of ISO 19650 and the viewpoint for projects classification tool. So, um, I'm going to hand over now to our first um, um, speaker, um, um, Dr. Stephen Hamill. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I'll just uh, share my screen. Hopefully people can see the, the title slide. Yeah. That's um, all good. Thanks. Good. So it was a relief when you can share the screen there. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, my name is Stephen Hamill, Innovation Director at MBS. And today we look at uh, Uniclass 2015. We'll have a little introduction to Uniclass, we'll then uh, talk a little bit about how Uniclass is uh, developed and who contributes to its development, and then finally we'll look at some sort of high-level examples of Uniclass in use before passing on to Adrian from Galford Tribe to we'll look at that in sort of more detail at the real sort of like practical level. So Uniclass 2015, it's a classification system for managing information in both uh, construction planning design and construction and also asset management and it's developed by mbs but working both with industry and uk uh, government and it's a uh, continued development and it's a uh, completely free to use and we we, we publish updates to uniclass uh, every three months uh, we talked a little bit about the 9650 framework of standards, but Uniclass itself is uh, structured according to the, the international standard ISO 12006 part two, that has all of the principles and framework for a set of classification tables for 
or construction industry. And it's developed for both buildings and all of the infrastructure sectors. So roads, rail, tunnels, water, waste, as well as the, the, the buildings that are part of the, the, the built environment. And it's developed for the whole uh, life cycle of an asset from the sort of strategic planning stages all the way through to uh, in use and uh, demolition. This little video sequence just gives examples of some of the classifications from the various tables. So buildings themselves can be entities. Uh, this uh, tables for spaces and locations, like playgrounds or beaches. Uh, buildings themselves are entities. And then inside those entities that have classifications, you can break down the, the entities into the spaces and locations themselves, such as plant rooms, kitchens, toilets. And then creating those spaces and locations are the, the elements, the systems, and the products. So if we just take a cut, uh, through this building here, you can see that elements such as walls and floors and, and roofs uh, divide the building up. And then the elements themselves are made of systems like a structural wall or a cladding system. And then those systems are made up of products, uh, things like uh, particle boards, carrier rails, uh, insulation foam boards, uh, etc. And the current list of human class 2015 tables that real large scale, you have your complexes, entities, spaces, locations, activities, and there's common coding between those tables. So things specific to the transport sector will be in uh, category 80. Uh, environments 32, residential 40, 45. Uh, it, so there's a real sort of connection between those tables. So spaces, buildings, complexes for transport are all a similar a numbering scheme. And then when you break those down into the smaller items, you get into your elements, systems, and products. And you can have products which serve like many pairing systems. So like a plastic sheet could have potentially a hundred different uh, uh, pairing types. Uh, we also have tables for project management, forms of information, roles, tools, and equipment. So like all of the information requirements that you'd have, so like scattered around your common data environment can have those codes and Adrian will show some of those uh, later on. We've got two tables that are in development uh, next year for activities to do with the process itself and also some sort of like generic properties and technical characteristics as well. And they're both aligned to the, the ISO. Uh, engaged with a huge number of uh, organizations over the last six, seven years, just some examples of the, the really large large UK government organizations and construction industry organizations on the screen at the moment. Uh, Viewpoint are a, a partner of MBS and have integrated unit class into their, their systems. Uh, and then if you want to see more case studies after today, so building on the Galford Tri case study, you can go to our website, the mbs.com forward slash events. I just want to highlight a couple of the on-demand webinars we have that give really good practical examples. Is this one from the Department for Education working with Bond Bra in digital? And that goes through how like inside an information container, in this case IFC, all of the different objects are classified for Department for Education by the, the Uniclass system. So you've got an IFC file that has the objects and the relationships, but those objects themselves, if we sort of zoom in. You can show this, that at the building level, you've got entities, the spaces have spaces, locations, activities, and then products and systems themselves. And those relationships in IFC with the classifications can then get exported to information exchanges such as uh, COBE as, as well. And then moving away from uh, buildings and going to a sort of wider built environment, inter infrastructure example, environment agency, Fantastic case study again, you can get on the MBS website. And it's from a completely different angle. This is their sort of uh, data requirements library or all of their assets that go across the, the United Kingdom. Each one of them having a, a unit class code, see there on the right hand side, whether it's a system, a product, uh, whether it's an element or a function. And then finally having the environment agency's technical requirements against each one of those types with like, going down to things like enumerated values and uh, data types. And 
it's, it's really fantastic uh, to study this environment agency one uh, announced earlier this year was the government and industry interoperability group so this is a, a, a government initiative that, that i think was originally announced in the transforming infrastructure uh, performance uh, roadmap to 2030 a strategy document that was published but this has got five or six different work streams uh, that are really going to push on the interoperability agenda in terms of sort of the digital journey I mean, classification is one of these how classification sits against ifc and kobe is another work stream and uh, i think there's a number of presentations of digital construction week two weeks ago where that really kicked off and at mbs i have two of my colleagues that are seconded for part of the week working on this uh, on this initiative so sarah delaney our head of classification and also one of my colleagues uh, chris chris vickers who's a, a technical expert and at MBS, we use Uniclass ourselves now in our core products. So on the left-hand side, that's our MBS Chorus specification platform. And inside the specification, all of the systems, all of the products, all of the activities can be classified by Uniclass 2015, whether it's building services like CCTV systems or building fabric like a, a concrete block that's part of the, the masonry wall leaf. And that allows our MBS authors to put the technical characteristics, links to the standards, guidance, all against a common structure. And on the manufacturer product information side, our MBS source product has all of the technical information from manufacturers structured by Uniclass 2015. And that means that we can connect construction product manufacturers with specifiers using that same digital interoperable language. So your generic concrete block specification on the left-hand side aligns with the concrete block specification from a specific manufacturer same terminology aligned with the British standards and then when it comes to publish your specification typically that's going to you know, be somebody generating a PDF at that point in time and you know, pushing it up uploading it to a, a system like like viewpoints you can use all of the uh, classification codes and also then things like the naming conventions the attributes that are defined in ISO 9650 to allow you to quickly find the specifications you published, what was this suitable for, who published it at what time, and have a record of that sort of fixed in time uh, PDF uh, content. But within that PDF is the well structured information, your systems, your products, and you can show what's changed through the project timeline. So if you think of that thread of information, yes, things are going to change in the documents and the drawings, but specifications are also a, a key point key part of that. So in, in summary, before I uh, pass across to, to Adrian and Ben, Uniclass 2015 free to use specification system and classification enables interoperability. You can go across all of the information containers and the information inside information containers. And it's an initiative led by MBS, but working with industry and government. And it's now embedded in many software systems. It's, it's not just for the 3D modeling side, it's information management, asset management, a specification as well. So thank you very much for uh, listening to the short presentation today and I look forward to the questions and answer later. Please pop any questions in the chat and I'd be really interested to, 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 to see what the queries are. Well, thanks very much, Stephen. Um, just a quick one before we move on. I know you talked quite a bit about interoperability, but I had a couple of questions popping up during our presentation, which are maybe may seem quite simple ones. But I think one person was asking whether the updates in Uniclass are compatible with Apple Mac computers. And I got someone else asking whether um, it's interoperable with Revit. Yeah, so if we pick maybe both those questions up. Uh, the first one about the interoperability with different computer systems. Uniclass itself is it's it's a database of codes, so it's compatible with any device, whether you just download it's handheld, it's the software that uses it. And I know over the years MBS has been criticized a little bit for just having software for PCs and not also the Apple Mac. But now all of our products are in the cloud. So whether you're on an iPhone, a Mac, a PC, uh, you can access all of the MBS software. The second question about Revit is, 
yeah, we, we, in the UK, I think most people probably now annotate drawings and schedules that are generated from Revit uh, with Uniclass codes. I think it's a classification manager tool you can download from Autodesk. And of course, there's the MBS plugin for when you're connecting your specification uh, with the model. So Uniclass works really well in all 3D modeling tools, Revit, but also Archicad, Vectorworks, Bentley, etc. Great, thanks very much, Stephen. So I'm going to hand over now to our next speaker, um, Adrian Shilladay from Galliford Tri. So thanks very much. Um, over to you, Adrian. Uh, good morning. Hey, thanks, Tom, and thanks to Stephen. So I am just going to make sure that I am sharing the correct screen. Yep, that looks good. Fantastic. Yeah, the technology, you're not always sure what's going to happen with this as you do this live. Uh, so I'm going to cover a little bit about uh, where Gallifrey Try uh, uses classification and I just want to put uh, some sort of context into what I do and the reasons why I'm raising some of the things that Stephen has covered. Uh, so I look after design management and BIM. My colleague John Ford is part of the UK uh, BIM Alliance has been developing the guidance uh, but I also look after information management on our use of viewpoint for projects as our EDMS, but also looking at the wider use of classification. Uh, it isn't always data and models. I'll talk about some of the challenges that we have seen and potentially through the discussion today as to potentially some of the solutions that we could look at on this wider part. So we use FieldView as our digital tool and how do we classify things that are wider uh, than them. So a little bit of a background to our approach to 19650. Um, we were one of the first tier ones to migrate from PAS 1192 to 19650 back in 2018 and we established process maps and guidance and forms and checklists, a BIM execution plan templates etc. Guidance for clients that's always been a really key part and how do we help clients bring their BIM journey on board? Obviously, through the use of Viewpoint as our EDMS, we've got lots of guidance and templates and procedures, and we've got a BIM strategy with our process and software training. And all of this has been assessed by the BSI as part of our certification. And last year, which I think was probably the last time I was out at anything, uh, BIM Constructor of the Year 2020 at BIM Show Live, was this fantastic recognition of how we've integrated these into our wider processes. As I said, it's not just for BIM. So in terms of Uniclass, uh, there are lots and lots of different ways that we use it. Uh, we've obviously got our industry standards, client requirements of which Stephen has mentioned, uh, the work around COBE and classification across the standard facility space types and system object driven classification works fantastically well as Stephen showed how NBS ties in with the models, the structure, standardization and then also how we're starting to see our clients specify their requirements and that's where some of the challenges start to come in because they're having to produce documentation that explains their requirements, it's not always data driven and how do we bring that side of the industry along. So we work a lot with the Scottish Futures Trust They've got something called the Standard Information Management Plan, very much defined through Uniclass and looking at how we can then respond to that. National Highways, Asset Data Management Manual, all again based on entities, systems and products, all defined through Uniclass. Uh, similarly with the DFE and the teams who are developing that, that again, Stephen showed on his presentation. Uh, and so it's looking at how we can respond and then similarly, again, the environment agency and the water industry, all defining through products and systems. So we as a business need to be able to respond to that and develop design responsibilities matrix and the challenges that we see looking at work breakdown structures for our information release schedules, our master information delivery plans and the challenges which we'll come on to today. And again, through use of the the electronic document management systems as part of the CDE. How do we take that on board? And Ben again later will show some of the tools that they put in place to help with that. But then wider, how do we take that out onto site? How do we get thousands of 
site teams and subcontractors to come on board looking at check sheets and quality and health and safety. How do they bring all of those things together and the challenges of bringing that language into the industry? So it's not just for them. So some examples, so the Scottish Futures Trust specified through project management tables and into the system tables. You start to see they're producing documentation to specify the requirements. And the same for the national highways. They've got their asset data management manual specified through Uniclass, but also then trying to align back into their more commonly known language for the manuals for highways works in the series. So there's that common language that starts to come through. As I mentioned, the design responsibilities matrix, it isn't just for BIM models and data. There's lots of other things that as contractors and subcontractors we need and information that we need to be able to price and to build and deliver the quality that our clients require. And that's where we start to look at these wider issues of buildability and safety and design and regulation compliance and performance requirements and how the tables start to help us define those requirements in a consistent way. And also from what this presentation from Stephen and the quality of the models, not everything is modelled, so we have to describe in certain ways how do you get that information. And actually, over the last six months, with the updates that have come out, manually actually reading that information, considering that a human has to read those, sense check the standards and the tables, do they make sense? What are the impacts onto our projects? So that's a, a challenge that we've had. But the tables themselves, fantastically useful for defining your project management requirements. Uh, but sometimes we have to supplement that. How do you deal with the detail? How do you deal with the common language? Plus, in terms of the length of the tables as well, we have only used three levels of code. Uh, it does go to four. Uh, but then we're still having to supplement for that common language within some of the documentation uh, that we've got in place. So it's just striking that balance is sometimes a challenge. And then again, it's under, getting the understanding out into industry, and Stephen and Ben and I talked about this over the last few days, the wider knowledge. So the example that we see is fantastic resource, and the Scottish Futures Trust have used this very well, around handover information, absolutely critical off the back of Grenfell. But there's a bit of a lack of knowledge in the industry that even this type of classification assistance exists and it's just looking at the challenges how do you cascade that into industry a little bit better and again through the systems tables that Stephen showed through NBS and the models covers all sectors but it's not well known with BIM circles or design circles how do we expand that out and again dealing with some of that common language that you need to put in place uh, how do you clarify some of those requirements? So if we're looking at concrete foundation systems, what information do we need? How do we break that down into manageable chunks? How do we develop documentation that covers all of those little buildability things that are required on site and understanding who is responsible for that at each of the stages? Because it does often change and it's just how clear can you be with some of those requirements? And then again, dealing with the complexity and the extent of the Uniclass tables. So the systems table, for example, there's 2,400 rows to four levels of code. How do you deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis? Once you add on the product codes, nearly 8,000 codes there, how do you strike that balance again? So within our documentation, we've tried to strike a balance, looking at systems, what are the products that sit within that? understanding how the tools are going to be developed and the NBS and CDEs to sort of bring all of that together because we're still working out with some of these digital tools in Excel and Word, etc. And then again, the, as I said, with the design responsibilities matrix, the master information delivery plan, again, isn't just for BIM. There's a lot of other information that we need to produce how do we categorise that? How do we standardise that? How do we bring all of that information together is quite critical. And again, looking at the extent and the detail and the number of codes, how do you break it down into little chunks that makes it easy, readable, 
manageable by uh, the teams delivering the projects out on site. Um, and then again, looking at the complexity of what we have to manage. So I've just got, hopefully this works on your side um, in terms of how this scrolls across. Yeah. So you've got your work breakdown structure, PM and systems tables, the level of information need, assigned IDs, names and functions, stage requirements, information status dates, and then all the way through to how do we allocate that data and information into packages that we use to price, whether that's NRM1, NRM2, for into infrastructure for SESM, into the manual for highways works. So again, bringing all of these different types of information and ISO requirements together is sometimes um, a challenge. And then again, dealing with the challenges of the annex itself and the standards been written to try and cover all of the different scenarios. But when you're then trying to bring some sort of standardization to that, how, does you, how do you deal with that as an industry? How do you deal with that as all the different groups who have to come on board? So how do you name a file from each of the disciplines? How do you deal with a system that may come from a specialist? General arrangement drawings and spatial drawings. How do you deal with all the different roles and discipline specific information that may be produced? How do you bring that all together and get that understanding across to quite a lot of people across uh, the industry. And I think that's where highlighting some of these challenges and potentially through the various working groups, more guidance and examples can be developed to help with those challenges. And then as Ben's going to come on to later in the use of common data environments, understanding how you apply this on a day-to-day -day basis, bringing in all the team, looking at workflows and the statuses, making sure information follows through those stages, using the correct terminology, standardising the approach, and then starting to bring in how does classification help you deal with all of these challenges when you've got thousands and thousands of pieces of information and files and data uh, coming in. So this is the extract of our uh, viewpoint uh, EDMS just a part of it, and looking at all the different scenarios of how you can name files, containers, folders, looking at the mix of tables that Stephen showed earlier to come up with what is the most streamlined, simple approach that means that it's human readable across a wide, wide team. And again, some of the interoperability groups that Stephen mentioned, how do we look at the tools, how do they exchange, that again starts to drive the standard approach where the software helps more and more uh, to assist with this. So again, looking at classification of information, which Ben will come on to a little bit further, um, looking at how you can define different approaches. So we've looked at some examples as part of our viewpoint setup and how you could potentially have multiple classification to different types of information. How do you actually manage that? So looking at the extent of guidance that needs to be applied to the system. But as I mentioned earlier, it's not just for BIM. So we use quality check sheets on site. We've got digital tools for that. And we've traditionally built up over decades, traditional uh, forms of communication of the forms and names. How do we then migrate that into a uniclass format? So using systems codes or product codes, how do you deal with that wider use uh, in industry? So again, challenges on the detail that you go to, as I mentioned earlier, the thousands of rows of code, and how do we then make check sheets and collecting data? So off the back of the building safety bill, huge focus on quality and fire stopping and fire performance products. How do we do? make sure we've got quality, collecting data, feeding that potentially back into models and specifications uh, to make sure that we're providing all of the handover information in the correct format. And at the same time, explaining that to potentially thousands of staff and supply chain to bring that new terminology on board. So in terms of a little bit of a summary, um, there is still a getting to grips with the standards and the changes. Uniclass is a little bit different to CISFB and COS and NRM1 and NRM2 and CESM. And it's just how do we get that out into industry? 
there are a lot of codes. How do you strike that balance so between making it usable on data and models against documentation that the wider team start to use? And getting the tools brought up to speed and the work from all the common data environment providers and people like the NBS providing their classification tools, they're all starting to go down that route. And how do we get them to exchange in a much more efficient way? Um, so, but we are getting there slowly, and I think part of today is to start looking at those challenges and to bring that all together. Um, so that is all from me. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thanks very much, Adrian. Um, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I can see there's quite a lot of challenges there as well. So, before we just quickly before we move on to to, to Ben, I mean, overall. Is this a benefit to you? I mean, as a contractor, as a boss, yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. We see the huge benefits of being able to have a standard approach to specification and classification, all the way through from to products, but also project management tables, which I think probably don't get the recognition that they have in being able to specify all of those general requirements for handover and performance and fire and acoustics, environmental issues, sustainability and carbon. Those are all there in a standardised format. And I think the challenge is to get that recognition out in the industry, get more people using it. And there is sometimes discussions like this uh, that starts to bring that recognition. But we absolutely see the benefits of it. Uh, but it's that wider piece of the into industry is the big challenge yeah absolutely brilliant well thanks very much Adrian. so um i'm gonna hand over now to our last presenter um ben Wallbank um from Trimble viewpoint thanks very much ben so can you see my screen um yes i can yeah excellent okay um So starting off with a little um, riddle, if you like, you know, when is a naming convention not a naming convention? And the unfortunate answer is when it's ISO 19650 or more specifically, um, the UK annex to uh, BSEN ISO 19650 part two, which defines the UK naming convention. Um, gone are the days when, um, under BS 1192, I could go from contractor to contractor, consultant to consultant, I'd go into their office, and if they were using the standard, I could pretty well understand what um, what, what something was going to, going to be about, what a, what a container, a file um, was going to be about, just by looking at the naming convention, which was fantastic and has huge advantages if you think about you know, staff moving from company to company and immediately understanding what was going on. Um, so the UK Annex Naming Convention splits down into into parts, um, as did the um, uh, as did BS 1192, um, and it will maybe and, and it is a maybe now look something like that. Now, in a way, you can still um, say that this is a structure which which will help you um, to 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 define what things are. Um, but uh, the problem with the new annex is that for every single one of those sections, it allows the user to define specifically for the project what that naming convention is going to be. And of course, this really means that for every single project, a naming convention is newborn. Um, it's, it's going to be bespoke for that project, which loses a lot of that huge benefit that we've had. Now, um, in Viewpoint for Projects, we have a, thank goodness, highly flexible naming convention tool. But it still means that now the contractor is going to be inheriting a naming convention which has largely been um, developed by the design um, and consultants team. Uh, so, so you know, often a contractor will only get on board in work stages three or four, um, by which time uh, an, a naming convention has been developed, which doesn't necessarily satisfy the needs of the contractor. And this is a real, I, I think, a real problem and a great shame. Now, we can actually moan further about the ISO and say that, of course, status and naming convention should have been 
part of the hub, not the spoke, i.e. part of should be international. You know, for me, it's crazy that, um, you know, if we, if we work in Ireland, we have a, an Irish annex, which has different statuses and different naming conventions. Um, you, and this comes with a whole a whole bunch of of uh, you know very obvious problems. And and this of course is where Stephen is uh, is Superman and and solves the problem to a large extent. Him and the team developing uh, Uniclass um, because Uniclass is immutable. Each section means a particular thing, uh, and this actually then then allows the contractor a, a methodology through which they can they can uh, do something which will be uniform from project to project to project defining what it is that uh, uh, that, that something is about uh, so under bs 1192 you could if you wanted to um, always have put in um, classification so that's that that first uh, that first bit is is is, is classification um, and then you could also add on add on um, revision and uh, and status as well as part of the naming convention itself. And frankly, most people did, didn't do that. Uh, in the ISO, um, classification is no longer. If you if you are going to conform with the standard, classification is no longer uh, a a uh, a voluntary uh, field. It is a compulsory field of metadata. To be to, that, that you must include. So you should always, as you you upload a container, as as I say, call it a file, as you and I would probably still call it, as you upload a file, you will add a classification onto it as a, as a piece of metadata. And of course, status and revision classification are are recorded by any decent CDE as a, as, a, as a matter of course. Um, and. You know, just to be clear, uh, the, the the standard says that it is Uniclass, which is the classification which should be used. Uh, and the important thing is that when somebody downloads that container or file from from the uh, C, from the CDE, it should it the CDE should add status and revision and any classification codes and you'll note i say codes not codes code to the item which is downloaded now in viewpoint for projects we have about six months ago we developed a, 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 a our first stage of our classification tool uh, so here it is if you're a, a, a user you can you can turn it on and start to classify items which are uploaded to the system so on upload, you'll notice there is now a classification uh, uh, field to be added, and we have all of the uh, all of the Uniclass tables in there. Now the, the standard actually says that uh, you should default where possible to the PR table, the product table. Um, in practice, we are seeing um, particularly the uh, the the um, uh, my brain. Um, <laughs> uh, the the one that relates to what what is what services. So if 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 it's a hot water system, for instance, you would you you know we're seeing that being used alongside product uh, as well. But in fact, you can you can add it from any of the tables. So what that means is that, that you you add the classifications in, and indeed you can add multiple classifications in against a particular item. So you know typically an architect's um, uh, drawing or model may be uh, applicable to more than one uh more than one set to set of classifications so those can all be added in and again as you download they're all added onto the onto the the downloaded file uh, now we've also because the classifications uh numbers are uh, you know you do actually get to know them over time but because they're not obvious if you hover over one of the classifications that have been given to an item the system will let you see what it is it'll actually say that, as you can see here that uh, that something is a cladding or lining panel or electrical hot water um, so uh, you know, reasonably easy to easy to manage. Now, we're also um, we're also adding a, the the ability, as I say, to to add on those um, uh, those classifications to your downloads. So we're trying now to obviously satisfy the standard, but we think that this is tremendously useful, particularly to the contractor, 
to be able, even if they're inheriting a, a, a naming convention, which is uh, not particularly useful to them, to be able to add the classifications, which are the same throughout, then to do searches that they will learn against that, you know, so typically classification would be used, for instance, to, to package up a job, you know, if it's brick and block relating to a brick and block package. Um, so it, it's really important to say that the classification tool is still very new within BFP, and we are um, actually working on it right now to, to do further things. And what's next? Uh, usual disclosure um, about, uh, you, you, you know, disclaimer rather about, about what we're doing, which is um, that, that I can tell you what's on the roadmap, but, but not tell you actually when it's going to be there. That's because we're part of a large American corporation. Um, but we are looking closely particularly now at relating classification, not just to the file, um, the container as it is in ISO 1950, but across um, uh, across the, 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 the actual folder or, or what, we, what we want to be, we call containers, um, which are containing lots of things. So there are lots of very clever things that we should be able to do, allowing us to link to virtual containers through, uh, through the classification given to an item on upload. Uh, so, that, so that we're certainly thinking about, um, and we're also looking at a, a, a larger tree um, of, of selection. So uh, as uh, Adrian said, uh, there are four parts to, to, the, to the unit class, and you don't always want to go that detail. So uh, a, a larger tree at the moment, it's, it's all of the classifications we need within each, each table, uh, but we want to make it so that it's... Uh, um, so, so that there is a, a, a greater hierarchy available. Uh, so those are the things that we're we're working on at the moment, um, and uh, they should be should be out um, out reasonably shortly. But this this is all really about how do you become compliant and allow uh, allow your classifications uh, what something is to be easily defined and found. Uh, so again, within the classification tool, there are now searches on text and parts of parts of text that will then return all of those all of those items classified in that way so much easier ways now of finding things and of course because the classification remains constant so you know that s on on superman's uh superman shirt if it's a classification we know it always stands for stephen uh not for superman uh because that's the standard way of, way of doing things so it, it will enable you to do searches across multiple projects um, you know, if you, if you, for instance, um, you, you know, you'll learn what your particular, what your particular classifications are. So it should make things a lot easier. Thanks a lot. Great. Um, thanks very much indeed, Ben. Um, so that ends the formal presentations now. So um, we've now got some time for um, questions uh, and answers, um, which our panel will provide. So if you'd like to all turn your cameras back on, that'd be really good. Um, so, and, and the audience who want to submit your questions, please feel free to do so. So, um, okay, first question that came through actually, um, I think during Stephen's presentation um, with Uniclass, is the international perspective, which of course ISO is all about. So, Uniclass, is that something that people will be using internationally, Stephen, or do individual countries have their own sort of equivalent of, of Uniclass? How will that? How, could, how might that work? Uh, I will corner that. Tom, but first of all, the Superman slide. <laughs> and, and I say I, I do a bit of talking about it's contributed documentation, but the, the real superheroes are the likes of Sarah that are actually there doing the work. So, uh, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, what was the question? International. So yeah, yeah we have, some, have seen a lot of interest in Uniclass internationally. Probably the most established is probably the Australian market, where some of their local governments, New South Wales, Victoria, have mandated it for some of their infrastructure projects. We've seen interest across Europe. Uh, Japan's been uh, some fantastic Japanese presentations where they've used the same codes, but obviously the Japanese character sets. Uh, and I think it's part of some of the, the work that the likes of Adam Matthews has done from what was the UK BIM task group in terms of pushing the UK BIM framework internationally, seeing their things like Central America as well, and going into South America. Uh, I think it's fair to say that in North America, in particular USA, the, the Omniclass classification system is very well established. So when we put our spec system into Canada, rather than trying to change an entire industry, we, we just use the Omniclass codes for the spec structure. 
So I think you've got to have a pragmatic approach. But Uniclass has done, done well internationally. Okay, thanks very much. Can I ask Stephen a question then? Um, so I remember ages and ages ago when Uniclass was just setting off that, that, that this, there was to be an alignment with the rest of Europe. Is that is that still envisaged that Uniclass will be, um, a, you know, we know over the pond they've got Omniclass, but uh, what, what about what about a more general thing, or is it is it now, is it now more sort of uh, the Commonwealth countries? We'll see. I don't think there's a consensus across Europe with so many different countries with their own initiatives. There's a there's another good classification system called Cunicol that's been produced as well. But I'd like to think as the years go by and people see the value and big multinational organizations want to have whether you're a client organization or a, a big multi participatory designer you do want to have that consistency across countries big manufacturers that want to standardize their information so we'll see but i think it's got to be done because people like it and the message gets out rather than trying to get some dictate uh, from the top great thanks um, so another question. I mean, we're getting quite a lot of questions about sort of um, proprietary sort of classifications, and uh, what, what this question is really um, reference to standards of parameters and classifications. Um, I, I, is anyone here working with SIBSI um, to incorporate their what they say are PDTs and PDSs, which are particularly useful to them? Um, how does that work when you've got organisations like services engineers, maybe of their own sort of systems? How does that work with Uniclass and with, with ISO um, 19650? Um, I'm going to go briefly first on that one. I think the classification can go across uh, any product data, sheets, product data templates, because that's basically, it is the classification that says what type something is. Across the industry, there's lots of initiatives on sort of standardizing technical characteristics like ETIM, Building Smart Data Dictionary, uh, SIPSI BIM. Or lexicon, we would our MBS products have their own uh, technical characteristics as well. In terms of SIPSI specifically, we, we've announced a partnership with SIPSI, you know, working closely uh, with them. So hopefully, we'll get a bit more alignment uh, there on the building services side. I don't know, Ben, Adrian. Yeah, I think alongside I mentioned that isn't just the data piece around product data templates. It's also aligned to costs and work breakdown structures and planning and getting that common language that people have just used for decades and decades. And sometimes there is multiple mapping that goes on. And though Stephen originally when Uniclass came out, did all the extra mapping and it didn't just quite map one to one. And it's just getting a better consensus as to how you deal with that and explain that old-fashioned approach that people have been used to and going actually in uni class you could do it in a slightly different way uh, so i know that bizria have also done for their bg6 they've shown how it would work in uni class as well as their traditional uh, specification system and they've got multiple tabs on their documentation to explain how they would all work together to the same sort of common purpose I think there was a good example that in one of the presentations I was watching at Digital Construction Week, Adrian, and I think it was Emma from the IFC and Classification Workstream, uh, Emma Hooper. And I can't remember the exact product that was used, but you could have something like a Mason Relief, which has got one classification in Uniclass. But if you're looking at the rules of measurement in NRM1, the rules of measurement are different, whether it's an external Mason Relief, an internal Mason Relief, whether it's below down group course, whether it's sort of decorative gardens and things. So it's impossible to have a one-to-one -one mapping, but once you have the context of the project and you know that mason relief is internal to the back of the pub or what have you, then the rules of measurement are NRM or internal wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And that's then where you showed on your, your slide, Stephen, around how entities and elements are made up of systems and end products and it's just that hierarchy to then bring that together and it's just working out how much detail you need to go in and it is easier within a model to do that than it is in wider documentation as I had shown within my slides. Um, I mean, 
on, on really on the same theme you know when you're looking at different sort of institutions and, and different people's way of doing things and classifying information i mean clearly there are benefits as you said early on adrian but is it a real challenge getting people who've always done something in a certain way on board because ultimately for this to really work consistency across all sectors of the industry is going to be the key thing yeah it is a challenge but i think some of it's down to how you actually do it if you were just to say there's the uni class 2015 full set of excel tables you're not going to go anywhere but if you then start to show this is what you called it before and on every project you had to change the name whether it's a work breakdown structure or a work package code which do change but with using UniClass and whatever various guides, you can go, actually, you don't need to change the numbering and the classification each time. And it is sometimes just breaking it down into small little chunks and putting it into that common language, which isn't, doesn't always come across in the BIM standards and the guidance. It is you no know, for the more well BIM experts, as you might call it, or pe people working in that model environment. It's just taking it to that next step and explaining it potentially in a different way, which is what we're trying to do with check sheets on site for quality. How do we reconcile that against what's in the model and what we need to hand over at the end? And it's just explaining that's where the industry is going is certainly a, a challenge. Thanks. And I mean, I think, you know, you, you, what, you, what you just said there is really interesting, it's, which is really what happens to the, I mean, the data at the end. It's a real value. And this information is in the asset is, is the asset management um so how does that how is that working i mean you know when you're looking at the um, fm industry are they bought into this whole sort of a, a idea of, of iso 19650 and and you i presume they need to be using uniclass as well yeah i think that one is another the standards have changed quite a lot not just for bim and uniclass over the last couple of years working with Bizria and Sibsi, all of they're updating all of their guidance. So Biz, BG78 came out for BG79 came out for handover information. That only came out last year. So again there's a transition period of time and people start to get their heads around how do you bring classification to those tools and then starting to see the clients that we've got, whether it's highway, national highways or the Scottish Futures Trust looking at how they can bring those together to satisfy their end requirements and it's down to then the software providers to start bringing that in and simplifying it so you don't have to think about it every single time and that mapping exercise that Stephen and Ben had shown. I think, I think Tom you talk about the benefits at the end of a project for one project but then you think of the big clients that have hundreds if not thousands of projects and assets across the country and Benefit your times in it by thousands, millions almost. And I go back to one of the slides I had, which was the Environment Agency presentation, where they've taken a step back from a single project and said, What assets do we have across the country? What information do we need about those assets? Whether it's embankments, flood defences, weirs, and have sort of taken that step back and just got things, got things right. Really good presentation. I, th I think things are changing too. Uh, you know, I've been on the technologies group at the UK BIM Alliance for many years now, and in its former role as um, uh, as well. Uh, and and certainly when I started, it was you know mainly BIM authoring um, softwares were were in attendance, and then it became BIM authoring and uh, data receiving softwares. Uh, and and now finally we have um, much more interest from the FM side of things as well. So I think things are changing. And, and, and what I'd say, you know, my little moan about, you know, when is, when is, a, when is a, a, you know, a naming convention, not a naming convention, everything, the more standardization that we can get both nationally as inter and internationally, everything that you, we can do that will make the way that you do things more regular from project to project, from team to team, the better and that will vastly help the software industry to get towards levels of interoperability that's which you know which is you know we're 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 on a huge journey at the moment to try and make data sets work together um uh you know and all of this all of this standardization 
you know, obviously, yes, we can map, you know, but, but it's, it's a pain. Uh, you, you know, the more standardization that we can get across the board, the better. Great, thank you. Um, so ne next question, um, which again relates to all this, is um, the golden thread. So is there any work and preparation being done to, in, um, to ensure that Uniclass is going to be really help implement the golden thread of information which anyone working on a harvest plan is going to have to do? Yeah, so I think I mentioned that within the, the, within the golden thread, obviously that's about the handover information that you know exactly what you've built within your project relating to fire safety products as the back of Grenfell, but also how do you specify those requirements at the very outset and track the whole way through that you've got it. So the uni class really does help with specifying that in a standard way to so the PM tables all the way down to this is my fire strategy requirement, where the performance requirements sit, how do the products then relate to that performance requirements, building regulation approval, all the way through to we have collected all of the information on site relating to all those objects that are within the project. And it's again bringing the regulations together and that back to basics understanding, not just letting the terminology and the tools all run away, actually step back, what are we actually trying to achieve? Can we standardise what that golden thread of information should contain? Not just here are the tools and the standards that go with that. So I definitely think that the, the Uniclass codes can certainly help with driving that standardisation of the golden thread going forward. And we've already started to look at that, particularly off the back of quality and check sheets. How do we bring that all together? The, the CD. The CD contains information, but you know, making it searchable is so important, and that, and that's where that's where you know, somebody classifying something then gives it that piece of metadata that you can search against. Um, that's you not that question. Millions and millions of, of, of items. Thank you. So another question is, I mean, I think quite a lot of questions are coming in. It's, it's a complex subject, and obviously, it's a, it's a lot to take in. What, you, what sort of support and training is available to different sort of sectors of the industry? For example, I mean, Asian, I guess, you know, you've got, you know, your, your suppliers, your subcontractors. Um, how do people, how do you get people on board? How do you train people up? How do you get them to adopt this? Well, certainly from our business, and actually I've just spent the last six months, we've got a business management system that everybody uses across the business. And we've actually integrated our BIM requirements, our ISO standards, into those processes almost clause by clause how do we satisfy iso and that means the documentation that we embed within our systems embeds uniclass or iso standards and then as part of our system we train out and then we then put those requirements to our supply chain we put them in our appointments to consultants and that's part of that project by project almost at the moment because it's just so much to do uh, and but we do go out to supply chain and our consultants and say this is what we expect you need to go and read this this is what we're our clients are wanting and it is just gradually building up that knowledge but as Stephen also showed within the NBS website there are lots and lots of webinars available and it is just getting people to keep up to date with industry uh, but it's not just BIM standards that we've certainly picked up oh, yesterday I had fire cover in my business and there have been so many new updates to just fire requirements and how do you read all of those alongside so i think there's a wider challenge to industry to get understanding how standards in general need to be used and then when you see bim standards they just become part of that wider industry requirements and just pushing that more and more on our projects will certainly push to drive that well, we've got uh, a few little sort of one hour CPD sessions that are sort of pro product neutral uh, on classification, on introduction to specification right and, and I think there's two two sort of uh, flavors to that. You've got the one more on the building fabric architecture side and then we've got the same topic from building service engineering as well. So you've got some, some free CPD to get started that are like one hour lunchtime courses you can watch on demand. 
Great. That sounds very useful. Um, well, we're actually out of time now. The hour has flown by. Um, it's been really, really interesting. Um, and, um, you know, it's, I can see that it, we're, we're starting on a journey, which ultimately is going to have a, you know, a very good sort of um, goal. Um, so, uh, anyway, on that note, I'd just like to say thanks to all our speakers Thank and you. thanks to everybody for listening. And, and um, just to say that this webinar will be available to download if you want to catch up with any of the points again. So, thanks very much. And, Goodbye. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.